I'm Harriet Bryan at Madison Street United Methodist Church. We had technical difficulties on Sunday, and the vast majority of the sermon did not record. Some of you were kind enough to ask if we would record a version and submit it, and so we are doing that now. And I thank you for expressing interest and for listening. I invite you now to hear the word of God as it comes to us from the second chapter of the book of Acts, beginning with the 42nd verse, and I am reading from the New Living Translation. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared their money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, we are living in challenging times, and I know I just stated the obvious, but my goodness, with this Delta variant, even those of us who have been vaccinated are pausing. we enjoyed not having to wear our mask everywhere we went. And now some of us are rethinking that um, because we don't want to be carriers of an illness that could harm someone else. Your church staff finds this to be a challenging time. We are committed to doing whatever is in our power to make sure that we maintain existing connections as a community of faith, as the body of Christ, that we create pathways for new connections and that we figure out how to build up community as you participate in life in person, virtually, and in hybrid settings. We are living in a both and world now and we are going to do our very best to figure out the next faithful steps. We are committed because we believe that God created us to live in community and that we are at our healthiest and best individually and that we have the greatest opportunity to make a difference for the world when collectively and corporately, when we are in healthy relationships with one another. And so this is a phase where I've laughed and I've said it's almost as if we are throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what will stick as we experiment. But we're doing it out of a love of God and a love for you. And I really do hope and pray that you will take advantage of different opportunities that we have. I'd like to recap as quickly as I possibly can how scripture, history, and psychology and the social sciences all bear witness to this truth that God created us to live in community. You heard the scripture that I just read, and I think it is fairly self-explanatory that as those early believers came together and engaged in worship and sharing of their belongings with each other, they attracted others to them who wanted to be a part of what God was doing in the world. And we are at our best when we live joyful, generous lives in community. This was certainly the case for the early Methodist. And forgive me for a history lesson now. For some of you, this will be a refresher. And for some of you, this may be new material. But John Wesley, founder of Methodism in Britain, along with his brother Charles and some others, but primarily John had this vision of transforming the Church of England, of having it be a place where people grew closer to God and closer to one another and lived out their faith in meaningful ways. And to that end, John Wesley started societies, large groups of people, where people would come together in order to hear the word of God and to watch over one another in love and to encourage and support one another. People in those societies 
committed to following three general rules. The first, to do no harm, insofar as, as it was possible to avoid evil of every kind, anything that would hurt someone else or be a harm in the world. Secondly, they commit themselves to doing good, to actively pursuing acts of mercy and kindness and compassion. And thirdly, they committed themselves to attending the ordinances of God. In modern vernacular, we might say staying in love with God by being involved in a worshiping community, by partaking of the Lord's Supper, of reading scripture, of praying, of fasting, of following those spiritual disciplines that deep in their faith. Now, John Wesley was a smart man. He realized that as important as it was to come together in a large setting, that because we all fall short of the glory of God and we're all a mixture of saint and sinner, we do best when we are in smaller groups where we can watch over one another in love and hold each other accountable. So John Wesley divided those societies into groups of 12 called classes, and each class had a leader, and the leader's job was to ask each member of the class, how is it with your soul, and to offer a word of encouragement, exhortation, reproof, whatever was necessary for that person to live out his or her faith most strongly and as well as that they could. And if someone was sinning, then the sinner was offered an opportunity for course correction. But if that person continued to fail to move forward in faith and to take those next faithful steps, then people would be asked to leave the class until they were ready to commit. Wesley also recognized that some people needed a little more assistance even than the groups of 12 offered. And so those people were invited to be a part of bands, of groups of, of three or four people who would come together in an intimate setting, pour out their hearts and pray for one another out of their deep desire to be faithful and their recognition that they could not live out their faith on their own. It has always fascinated me that our non-denominational brothers and sisters who have experienced such success with life groups have been inspired by John Wesley, by our founder, to say this is how we can live out our faith. And so I encourage you, if you're not a part of a small group, to consider joining one. These early Methodists were not only committed to a life of personal piety, but they were also committed to living out their faith in the world. And so when they gathered together, they collected funds and they used these funds to build schools, to build homes for those who are destitute, to build dispensaries, to make medications available for those who did not have access to medical care. They also were actively involved in the larger society where we might be tempted to think, oh, it's just too much. What can we do with everything that's wrong with the world? Those early Methodists said, oh, well, I'm called to make a difference and I'm going to make a difference. We are going to make a difference. And so they worked ardently for the abolition of slavery. They worked to improve the working conditions of the men and children who are caught up in an industrial revolution. And in so doing, they truly transformed society. Several years ago, I read a series of articles that have stayed with me because they fascinated me. They were about those early Methodists, and they were written by a conservative Catholic, a moderate Episcopalian, and a progressive Jew. I don't like to label people, but I share that with you to say that none of the authors were Methodists. In fact, they'd never heard of Methodists before, and they were trying to figure out why in the world there was not a revolution in Great Britain when France and other European countries had revolutions. And they decided it was because these people of Methodist, named Methodist, lived out their faith in such a way that a revolution was not necessary. And so what a challenge, what a legacy, what an invitation that is to us friends, what a reminder it is not to give in to those feelings of resignation and apathy that we have, but to remain true to our faith and to our heritage. So we can make a difference. Scripture tells us that, history tells us that, 
but it's not just good for the world, it's good for us. That's what psychology and the social sciences tell us. One of Harvard's longest running studies is the Grant Gluck study. I think I've said that correctly, it's G-L-U-E-C-K. But Harvard researchers have followed hundreds of people for 75 years, over seven decades, who are both Harvard graduates, that's one study, that's the Grant study, or the Gluck study, anyways, two separate studies, and one for people of um, a lesser socioeconomic background who live in Boston. And they have looked at medical records, including brain scans when that technology became available. They have uh, perused interviews and conducted a series of interviews. And over the course of time, they've decided, these Harvard researchers have decided that there is one single factor that makes a difference when it comes to a happy and fulfilled life. You guessed it, it is healthy and happy relationships. That relationships, even though they can be messy and complicated, meaningful relationships are the best predictor of how much meaning we will find in life. It's not what's in our bank account, our 401k. It's not how many followers we have on social media. It's not what positions we've held and what company. It's meaningful relationships. And so, out of that, plus knowing that the reverse is true, that loneliness can be have an adverse reaction impact on our life. That's the word I want, impact. As much as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, and that there are studies that show how uh, not being in healthy relationships, being lonely can impact our mental, physical, and emotional well-being, we recognize that God created us to be in community. And when we are in healthy communities, it's good for us and it has the potential to be good for the world. And for that reason, I have invited Jared to share with you some of the opportunities for community that we will be making available as we figure out our faithful steps in this both and world in which we find ourselves. Thanks, Jared. Friends, the eighth verse of the first chapter of the letter of James in the New Testament goes something like this, depending on the translation. This is the King James Version. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. I have to admit that as we have been forging our way forward as a church in the midst of this COVID pandemic, I have often felt like the double-minded man, plagued by doubt and blown this way and that by conflicting opinions, including my own. And I know I'm not the only one. I'm sure you've heard it or maybe even said it yourself. What should the church do next? Open up full throttle? Close down immediately? Wear a mask? Don't wear a mask? Social distance? Stop social distancing? Make it safer for people? Stop telling me what to do? Get back to normal? Embrace the new normal? Go online? Stop with the online and do everything we did before the pandemic. Where's the choir? What happened to Sunday school? Why is that door locked? The organ's too loud. I can't hear the organ on the live stream. We should be meeting in person. We should not be meeting in person. Get it together. Don't wait too long. Consider the risk. Let people make their own decisions. And do all of this as quickly and effectively as possible. It's often been said that the church is just a microcosm of the greater society, and I think probably every church in almost every place in our country is dealing with this same thing. And like the greater society, most churches, at least churches our size, are finding themselves living in what we might now call a hybrid modality. Part of us are online, part of us are in person. And friends, that's not going to change anytime soon, even if COVID were to magically disappear tomorrow. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's important for us to remember that ministry like this doesn't have to be an either or. We can successfully make this a both and. Now, an online approach to ministry may feel strange and frustrating if you're viewing it as simply a concession to survive the weird world of COVID-19. 
But the truth is that many effective churches have offered online ministry, whether it be worship, Bible studies, or small groups. They've been doing this for years. And if we're serious about our desire to share Christ with our community and to minister to our members, we have to continue our online work and we can't avoid the important work of extending our online presence. And at the same time, we can't avoid the important work of encouraging people to gather physically in our sanctuary or in homes or wherever and whenever it might be safe to do so. So as we head into a new year of program ministry this fall, you're going to see a little bit of everything. Our Next Gen Kids ministry will be offering in-person activities on Sunday morning and on Wednesday evenings, and we'll be working to provide online resources and activities so that families can equip children in their own Christian discipleship. Our Next Gen Youth leaders are looking at ways to engage our teenagers online while offering in-person Bible studies and social and mission activities. For adults, we're embarking on our new emphasis on common tables. You heard Ashley Knowles, our common tables coordinator, speak about this a few weeks ago in worship. Common tables are designed to be in-person, home-based groups that meet either weekly or bi-weekly, and whose focus is on doing life together. So often our small groups in the church have been solely focused on a Bible study and for a long time, the church has conflated the idea of Bible study or Christian education with discipleship. And they're really not the same. As I spoke about in last week's sermon, discipleship happens when we intentionally live in community with one another, much like Jesus and the disciples, much like the early church, and much like the early Methodists and classes and bands and societies. And Common Tables is a modern day approach to this. I'm not leading a Common Table this fall, but as I think about my own discipleship journey, I am looking very forward to being a participant in one. And I hope that you'll consider it too. In addition to this, there are folks gathering here at nine in the morning on Sundays in a traditional Sunday school format. We have a new gathering time at 9.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings at Fellowship Hall called Table Talk. Come have some coffee, grab some individually packaged refreshments, and get to know folks. We have in-person class options for adults on Wednesday nights beginning this coming Wednesday, September the 8th. Choir begins this week. Come and sing for a spell on Wednesday nights. And we have virtual only groups. I'm leading one that begins next Sunday at 5 in the afternoon. We've got a great group of folks already registered, but there's certainly room for more. Our Disciple Bible Study classes will launch within the next two weeks. These groups will be offered as in-person, online only, and hybrid groups. So in short, we have embraced the hybrid modality here at Madison Street, and there is definitely a place and a way for you to deepen your faith and grow in relationship with Christ and with others. And yet, even with all these options, that doesn't mean that this is going to be easy or that we're always going to get it right. I've been telling the staff for some months now that the fall of 2021 and winter spring 2022 will be a year of assessment for us. We're looking at what we've been doing online and in person and taking stock of what we've learned, what's worked well, what can be improved or expanded, what should we stop doing and what further investments are needed. Now there's no denying that this is a really difficult time to be thinking about committing to almost anything. COVID numbers are among the highest or in some cases are higher than they have ever been since the onset of the pandemic. It's hard in some capacity to even fathom what next week might bring and whether the church is offering online or in-person opportunities might not even be on your radar. And we understand that. As we continue to move together through the days ahead, there's going to be flexibility in what we're doing. Don't be surprised if you see beginning dates for certain events pushed back a little if that's needed. If you're intrigued by common tables but don't feel like you can commit to that beginning this next week, that's fine. This is not a one-shot deal. 
there will continue to be opportunities for groups to begin. So don't feel guilty if you're thinking you'd like to wait a few weeks to see if our COVID numbers drop a bit before jumping into something like this. As I said last week, flexibility and adaptability are the name of the game. And friends, this is church, at least in this season. Many of you have heard both Harriet and I speak about Tom Berlin, the pastor of Flores United Methodist Church in Virginia. Flores UMC began offering online worship literally years ago. And Tom tells a story of the associate pastor at Flores who hosted the live chat when their online services first began, going through this lengthy process to trademark her favorite statement. This is church. It reminded her that online worship and online ministry really was worship and really was church. And yet for many of us, there's no substitute for gathering together physically with one another in our sanctuary or being with one another together in a small group. And the good news here is it's all good because through whatever medium we are engaging, we're growing together in community. We are growing together in Christ. And we're transforming the world a little bit at a time. A while back, one of the questions we heard quite a bit was, when is the church going to open back up? Friends, this church has never been closed, but our ministry has fundamentally changed. And now is the time for all of us to thoughtfully and prayerfully consider how we're going to be part of it.